my very first year as a police officer, I received a piece of advice that has remained with me and has been a useful guide ever since. The advice was given to me by a man called Paul Whale and had been given to him by another detective during his first few years of service. The advice itself goes something like this. People will often tell you that the key to being a good police detective is to focus on every detail and simply follow the thread, but that's not entirely true. The key to being a really, truly effective officer is not to just follow the thread, but to realize that each thread is itself part of a patchwork, a woven lattice in which the threads of other crimes, incidents and accidents are overlaid and intertwined. What this little maxim communicates is the idea that no crime or case exists in a vacuum. Nine times out of ten, if you look back retrospectively at a case or crime that has been solved, you will be able to see in hindsight how that case touched upon others that, at the time, you thought were completely unrelated. For example, anyone who has seen a serial killer documentary on Netflix will know there is a direct and traceable link between cases of animal cruelty and later cases of murder and serial killings. It has been common knowledge for years amongst most psychologists and investigators that catching and convicting someone who is guilty of torturing animals is a preemptive bit of policing that catches potential serial killers before they have the chance to actually graduate to human beings or thinking about using the kitchen knife for something other than food preparation. The trick to good detection is not to see it only in retrospect, but to recognize when separate fragments make up pieces of the same jigsaw before things get out of hand, that is the secret of true detection. It's also a very difficult thing to do. When Adam Hardy was arrested in May of 2001, it was for one crime in particular, but it was by recognizing a number of other, smaller crimes and how each of those individual threads was woven up with the others that he was eventually caught and prosecuted. It started with thefts from Merton's butchers in town. For many years, Alan, an elder son in the family that had owned and run the business in Morton for decades, had made a habit of collecting the discarded animal bones after the trimming had taken place and storing them all together. This collection of bones was then taken to the animal shelter as a treat for the stray dogs that had been collected and kept there. I know there are some nowadays who argue that dogs shouldn't be given bones to gnaw on, but in Morton it was still the done thing and every evening on his way home after work, Alan would drop off a rather stained and foul-smelling bag to the folks at the shelter for distribution amongst the dogs. That was until late 2019 when he noticed that three or more times a week he would go out into the yard behind the shop where he kept the bones and find the bag missing. At first, Alan didn't say anything. At the end of the day, the bones were a waste product that was either going to go to the shelter or in the bin. But as time went on and the folks at the shelter became more often disappointed, he decided to report it. Not only because it was a theft, but because to get at the bag, someone would have had to scale the wall and jump down into the yard. Someone prepared to do that might be prepared to do other worse things, so it was worth reporting. I noticed the report, given to one of my colleagues, and decided that it was just curious enough to be of note. So I resolved to keep it in the back of my mind, in case I saw any other case to which it might relate. Around the same time, another colleague of mine was taking complaints from parents and concerned community members about online abuse that some local girls had been receiving, either on their personal accounts or on Morton community pages on Facebook and other platforms. The abuse, often violent and sometimes sexual in nature, was targeted toward girls attending the local community college and was all committed by the same individual, an account called the Tattered Hood 666. My colleague assured the complainants that he would investigate but I knew already that there would be little that could be done to trace the offender. Again, though, I resolved to remember the case. A few weeks after that, in a casual conversation with another colleague who was ironically complaining about how boring and tedious much of the investigative work was in Morton. After one or two examples about stolen bins and broken windows, he mentioned that someone has been vandalising books in the Morton Library and, in their words, stealing pages. When I asked for a little more detail, my colleague explained. Martin up at the library said that over the last few weeks, he'd had about six examples where he'd gone to lock up for the night and found that someone had taken books with them from the main reading rooms out to the public toilets in the corridor. The books are always left there, but they're always damaged. Someone has taken a razor blade or a stencil knife to the pages and either removed whole pages by cutting near the spine or cut out big sections from individual pages so there's squares and sections missing. 
Martin said he's had to order more of some books, but others are quite rare, and he can't get hold of other copies. I watched as my colleague took a large gulp from his beer before adding sarcastically, Like I said, it's all going Morton. What a thrilling white knuckle ride we are on. As wise men often warn, you should be careful what you wish for. Around three months later, things ratcheted up a notch. I received a call from Mikhail Poldov, one of the gravediggers up at Morton Cemetery, and was told of how three graves had been disturbed. When I first heard about this, I assumed that when Mikhail said disturbed, he meant that tombstones had been vandalized or spray-painted. The reality was much worse. The disturbed graves were recent burials, and in every case, not only had the coffins been opened, but the bodies had been mutilated in a very specific way. In each case, the upper thigh from the hip to the knees of the right leg had been removed. I attempted, of course, to keep those details quiet and out of the papers, but as with any small town secrets are hard to keep quiet, within days the exhumations and desecrations were common knowledge. Not that the spread of knowledge helped in solving anything, at least not initially. It was not until another two months later that the spread of the news came in hand, and by that time I was much more concerned with the fate of the living than the dead. Over the space of five weeks, girls had begun to go missing. Young women, all between the ages 18 and 20, had simply vanished at a rate of one a week. There was technically no indication of foul play. The girls had simply gone out for the night and failed to return home. A lot of my fellow officers thought it was simply a case of the girls running off for greener pastures in the city, something that wasn't too uncommon. What was uncommon was the rebellious teens leaving without either leaving a note or even packing a bag. It was my colleague who first noticed the disturbing connection between the girls. They all had, all five of them, been part of the group targeted online by the troll Tattered Hood 666. Suddenly, the runaway narrative seemed less plausible. Still, there were very few leads. Until that Martin Stern, the head librarian up at the Victoria Library, asked to see me. I said at the start that the key to detection was putting together disparate pieces. I never said it was me who did it. Martin came to the precinct with most of the details, and even a suspect. I only filled in the blanks. Having grown tired of finding his books damaged and discarded in the public bathroom, Martin decided to do some digging. Obviously, the person doing this wasn't going to check the books and then damage them, because then it would be obvious who had done it. However, it stood to reason that whoever was doing it had to know what was in the books before they wanted to take part of it home. So, Martin cross-referenced every book that had been damaged with every person who had checked them out in the past. Only one name came up as having taken out every book within the past year. Martin recognised the name. It belonged to a rather odd local lad of around 22 or 23 years of age. He would come to the library, spend the first few hours reading, and then ask to use the library's computers to access the internet. Checking back over the sites viewed by that individual revealed not only that he had been looking at some rather unsavoury material, but also that his username on a number of message boards matched that of the internet troll who had been sending abuse to the now missing girls. I asked the name, keen to go have a stern word with this little pipsqueak about his behaviour when Martin cautioned me. I think, he said, that we might be dealing with something a little more serious than that. He then showed me a series of printouts that he said matched the pages cut out of the books. They were books on the occult, hoodoo, grimoire magic and a bunch of other hocus-pocus nonsense. Only according to Martin, it wasn't nonsense at all. This section here, he said, is important. I read the details and saw that between the strange sigils and symbols, there were directions for attraction magic. According to the section here, you force something to happen magically by building up enough energy to divert the course of events as they are already destined to happen. Think of it like putting your hand into a stream of running water. It wants to flow in one direction, but if you steer with your hand, you can divert it, right? Usually, magicians try to change the route through ritual and correspondences, but you can shortcut it by making a sacrifice or performing somewhat more gruesome rituals. Look here. Martin pointed to a particular page that showed a man standing with his arm raised and a woman slamming as if worshipping at his feet. In this ritual, you take an animal bone. You scratch the name of the person you desire on the outside, 
carving it into the surface of the bone. Once you've done that, you then boil the bone until the marrow becomes more liquid or jellified. You must then suck out and drink that marrow, clearing out the bone until it is completely hollow. Then you write the sigil explaining your desire onto a piece of paper, roll it tight and place it inside the now hollow bone. The object of your desire is then bound to you. The problem is this, if the person already has feelings for you or is likely to welcome your advances, then the energy or water is already flowing that way. In those cases, it would be easy because destiny is already going that way. If they are resistant, as these girls would be, then it's going to take a bigger gesture or larger sacrifice to steer it in the opposite direction. If the person is open to your advances, then using a chicken bone would probably do it. But if not, then you'll need a higher order animal, a sheep, a cow, or... I saw immediately where this was going. An hour later, I was rapping on the door of Adam Hardy. There was no answer, despite the lights being on and the obvious signs of movement inside. I was considering going away to get the correct paperwork, but decided against it once Martin showed me the mountain bike cast into the long grass by the side of the house. That belongs to Beth Warner, one of the missing girls. She comes to the library all the time. I'd know that bike anywhere. She's here. She's in there. I kicked the back door in. I figured it was an emergency and if worse came to worst, Martin would be happy to say he did it and take a minor criminal damage charge. Within seconds of entering the house, it was obvious we were in the right place. The scene was like something from a weird orientalist painting of a sultan or pharaoh. Adam was lying on the bed. To his left, a girl in just her underwear was fanning him, whilst another from the other side of the bed was literally feeding him. The other girls, also in a state of undress, were curled up, resting or kneeling by the bed, all of them staring longingly at Adam, who was propped up and smiling. What are you going to do? He said. They're all here of their own free will. They love me. Seeing the collection of bones hanging from the ceiling by threads, including what looked like human femurs, from which Adam had sucked the dead marrow, I knew I had enough to charge him with disturbing the graves and desecration at least. Getting to him, though, was harder than anticipated. The girls fought, tooth and claw, to stop us from taking him away, and all the while, he simply laughed. On the way out of the door, hands cuffed behind his back and a huge smirk on his face, he said, You might want to think for a moment. If I can make them do that, just think what I could do to you. Adam was charged with a list of offences. I would have loved to get him on charges of exploitation or crimes against the women, but no one would speak against him. They had, according to them, suddenly and inexplicably fallen into utterly devoted and subjugated love with their online troll, a boy they had hated in college and who had previously spent time abusing them online. The change of heart from hatred to utter devotion was difficult to explain any other way than to take Martin's claims about the book seriously. So I also took Adam's threats seriously. Since the day he was charged, I have carried a collection of amulets and talismans prepared for me by supposed experts in these strange arts. Still, it does not make me feel safe. Adam will likely be out of prison within three years. After that, who knows what revenge he might seek against me. In the meantime, he spends his days reading the fan mail and love letters sent to him by the doting girls he refers to as his dollies. All of them are waiting eagerly for the day of his release. 